I think the most vivid example I can remember of storytelling with data happened in August of 2000. My best friend, Javier, had talked me into doing the AIDS vaccine ride. So we committed to riding 510 miles from Fairbanks to Anchorage, Alaska that August. And at the opening ceremony, we were all gathered, all the bikers were ready to get out and get on the road and do our first 80-mile day. And they brought up on stage 34 riders. Now, 28 of the riders were wearing black jerseys, representing at that point in time the 28 million people in the world living with AIDS and HIV without access to the meds that we have here in the West. But six of the riders were wearing yellow jerseys, representing the six million people, mostly here in the United States, living with HIV and AIDS, but having access to the antiretroviral drugs. But then, they brought up 12 children wearing red jerseys, representing the 12 million orphans who had lost both father and mother to the HIV and AIDS pandemic. We were inspired and ready to take action. That gave us the impetus we needed to do six long days of writing and raise net over $4.2 million for the AIDS vaccine. That is powerful storytelling with data. Early in his career, Albert Einstein warned us that if we try to complicate things, we're actually making them more violent. <laughs> Later in his career, he said it much more succinctly. Make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. None of us sets out to create a bad visual, a bad graph, or a bad chart. But we do. I found this on the copier at the Graduate School of Business. One of my colleagues had left it there. <laughs> They've stopped answering my request when I say, could I have a copy of your slides? Because they know what may happen to them. <laughs> there is no story here. There is no insight here. And it's not just faculty. This is one of my MBA students. Give you a moment. Now, there's a lot of challenges with this chart. The color of the legend changes company to company from the top to the bottom. We do not have the ability, we have a hard time even reading pie charts. We don't have the ability to figure out the arc between the inner circle and the outer circle. And you know how you know it's a bad chart? He put a paragraph in the middle telling you how you could understand the chart. That's not a clean visual. But it's not just in academia. This was produced by consultants who were advising the U.S. military <laughs> on how to stabilize the Afghanistan crisis. <laughs> it showed up on the cover of the New York Times, it showed up on the Jon Stewart show, and Governor, uh, General McChrystal is quoted as having said, when we understand that PowerPoint slide, we will have won the war. None of us set out to do these things to our audiences, but we do. The act that we are all involved in, as we begin to look at what story the data tells us, I liken to an iceberg. 90% of our work is below the surface. It's the collecting, it's the organizing, it's the synthesizing, it's the scrubbing or modeling or analyzing the data that we need to do before we tell the story. And 10% of our work is that which shows up above the surface, illustrating, sharing the story. Now, anytime I start a conversation about communicating, I go back to the fundamental model I teach in all my classes at Stanford, developed by uh, Mary Munter at the Tuck School at Dartmouth and Lynn Russell at Columbia. Who is my audience? What is my intent? What is it that I want them to do with the information? And then I craft the message, in this case, a story. Too often, we jump immediately to the message, and we don't think about who is it that I'm trying to reach and what is it that I'm asking them to do. 
in essence, what I think happens is we exist on a continuum. Some of you, and you know who you are out there, you live in this analysis paralysis. You're like, let's run one more regression. What if we compare it against data from 10 years ago instead of just five years ago and last year and last quarter, and you end up staying underneath the surface and never coming above? And at the clear other end of the spectrum is just as devious. Those of us who just tell stories, who pick anecdotes rather than, than looking at the data. The CEO who makes a change in policy after hearing one complaint from one customer. Or the marketer who uses anecdotes to convince us to buy something based on cherry-picked data. I have bought a whole lot of diet products because of anecdotes. <laughs> Where we want to exist is that sweet spot in the middle where we are respecting the analysis and we are looking for the stories, but we are focusing on how to craft, illustrate, and share a story that causes our audience to take the action we want them to take. That's what an insight is. So let's look briefly at each of these three steps. First of all, I want to craft a compelling story drawn from the data. I love the analogy from Michelangelo, where he would look at the, at the, at the um, granite and want to have the sculpture come out to him, speak to him. That's what we want the data to do. Now, there are many examples of storytelling structure. I like this one that, that is based on the work of Freitag from decades ago, that, that a story has to have an opening and have to give you a little bit of background, not a ton, has to have a rising action and a climax. That is the question we're trying to answer. That's the conundrum. That is the puzzle or the problem that we're trying to answer by looking at the data. And then ultimately, a resolution. Note that the resolution is a little higher than where we began because we hope that things are better on the other side. So we want to first understand what's the arc of a good story. Best place to go is look at some of your favorite films and the arc of a great story there. Then we have to move to illustrating that story from the data. Now the tools that we use regularly give us a lot of default images and, and graphics. Some of them are good, some of them are better than others, some of them are not so good. I urge that you take some ownership and illustrate the data yourself. You will have more ownership of the data and you'll have more power over what you're doing. Now we don't have time in the few minutes that I'm up here to give you a lot of information about how to illustrate, but let me just give you some do's and don'ts. On the do's side, I encourage you to begin with a blank landscape. Let us know what the axes are, let us know where the research happened, and then populate the X and Y graph with the data. Use reveals to tell the story as you go along. You can use color strategically to do this, but carefully. Just because we can click on that box in Excel to get the color panel of 68, 68, 680 colors doesn't mean we should. What we want to redo, do with our visuals is reduce clutter and ultimately reduce cognitive load on our audience. And I encourage as a part of this, limit your use of legends. Every time I look and have to go to the legend and look back and go back to the legend, I'm making my audience work harder. And then a few things for you to avoid doing. Avoid 3D, unless you're actually <laughs> comparing something in three dimensions. Um, use the double Y axis I would eliminate or, or rarely use and use with illustration. Not just rely on the default charts that are created for you, but look at what the story is telling you that you want to share. Avoid the dessert charts, pie graphs, and donut charts. Uh, th th there are much more better ways to illustrate and not to manipulate the x-axis. It's a great example in one of the books that I'll share with the, the breakouts this afternoon uh, uh, from Fox News where they didn't use zero as the x-axis, they used like 50 as the x-axis and it made it really look dramatic. It wasn't that great. So a few do's and don'ts on illustration. And if you want to go into this further, there's a breakout at, at uh, 3 or 5 and 5 o'clock. I'm glad to give more information on that. But the final piece is that which rises above the surface, sharing the story, telling the story to your audience. First, you need to know your audience. You need to meet them where they are. 
I encourage as you tell the story that use a Goldilocks level of detail, just the right amount of detail. Not too much, not too little, but enough that the story is clear to them. And as we talked about earlier when crafting the story, it should end with a very clear call to action. It shouldn't just present data for us to draw conclusions, but for us to choose to take an action. If we do that effectively, we will not only tell great stories that move our audience, but hopefully, as James Buckhouse as Sequoia says, it's not just the story that I tell or the story that you hear, it's the story that they repeat. In order to have that story repeatable, we have to commit to it being a powerful, compelling story. So then the answer to the question, what is the secret sauce to storytelling with data? It's each of you. You know the story you want to tell. Create that story. Let's go out, share some stories, honor our data, and serve our audience. Thank you.